box sir to you thank you chairperson uh, and thank you bansi sir for inviting me here and uh, this mixed bag of topic is getting really interesting and i have also a very interesting topic here that is diabetes in elderly no one of the most i would say non discussed topic and one of the most i would say neglected topic in our busy opd when we see lots of geriatric patients and we keep on doing uh, the other counseling what is required so we are getting lots and lots of type 2 diabetes patients which are getting elderly 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 and you can see from the graph here the graph is increasing at the as the age progresses there is some decline later on because we all know uh, once there is a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes the life expectancy reduces by 14 to 15 years so you will see less diabetic patients at the end of their life but the thing is uh, the same thing dr komal has mentioned why we are seeing blue zones not in india is because we are getting you know we are being diabetes capital of the world and elderly cannot survive this disease as efficiently or as healthily as the others can do if they have diabetes so it is a very complex disease and when hyperglycemia comes in you know along with the friendship of uh, aging it becomes more complex because of the other co-existing illnesses you know there is increase in the adipose tissue and sarcopenia as dr vijay patni has mentioned also there is reduced physical activity there are multiple medications going on for multiple co-existing illnesses and genetics and poor nutrition also take a big part in that on the converse side if you see if the poor diabetes control is there it exacerbates the aging process also it causes age related diseases to develop earlier we have so many case reports and uh, analysis suggesting a simple example being the alzheimer disease or other dementia when the patient has poor diabetes control dementia occurs a decade early also in many of the patient and similarly poor glycemic control makes other conditions to manage very difficult in elderly so why it is becoming chal- challenging to manage diabetes in india uh, diabetes in elderly one of them is symptomatology just of a few minutes ago we have discussed stroke mimicker suppose patients come with hypoglycemia the symptomatology is different in diabetes and uh, in geriatric also the disease itself is a having a different symptomatology what we call geriatric syndrome where symptoms are very very similar or overlapping with type 2 diabetes and its complication so is a simple chart where you can see on the left side aging is symptoms are there which can directly mimic with signs of diabetes also like dimness of vision can occur in both urination again a sign of aging it can be there in in the uncontrolled diabetes due to polyuria and nocturnia fatigue is very very common thing in diabetes where aging where people says i cannot walk like i was walking at tw- age of 20 atherosclerosis is age dependent process but mi and cvas are two to four times more common in type 2 diabetes similarly you know change in gait elderly gait we know and similarly neuropathy food deformity or cerebral ischemia can have patient some kind of gait deformities also in diabetes similarly pa- elderly patients once their cognitive function no declines there is restlessness no there is confusion the cognition is impaired similarly when patient has very high glycemic load and sometimes hypoglycemia also these symptoms can occur another thing why it is challenging is we can we are not able to assess our elderly patient it is not simple tpr bp or weight or rbs no we need to have actual physical assessment of our elderly type 2 diabetes patient for mobility also for physical activities also nutritional assessment of elderly again a separate topic neurological assessment because our patient will have multiple neurological comorbidities and it is a part of aging also we should accept that and there are a few other special areas like psychosocial support and psychosocial understanding of the patient what we call cognitive activity and cognitive function of the patient needs to be assessed so we can decide in the type 2 diabetes care another aspect is the hypoglycemia on awareness you now we have seen uh, uh, the case of a uh, stroke mimicker just before that so hypoglycemia on awareness is there in elderly and this patients tend to go more in level 3 hypoglycemia or severe hypoglycemia what we call 
if you see one uh, this study very interesting you can see uh, the symptoms of hypoglycemia they they are relatively less perceived by elderly patient as compared to relatively younger patients you can see here we know there are two main types of hypoglycemia symptoms autonomic symptoms via parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system activation like tremor hunger perspiration all those things you can see the first graph here you know the middle aged patients like 40 to 64 they perceive hypoglycemia relatively early so this is the hypoglycemia perception scores which are higher in middle aged patients but elderly cannot perceive these autonomic symptoms more when the patients have of more than 65 years of age with hypoglycemia the autonomic symptoms are relatively masked so they are getting diagnosed late similarly neuroglycopenic symptoms where you no know, hypoglycemia has uh, no uh, progress to such an extent that brain is deprived of glucose and similarly this neuroglycopenic symptoms occur similarly for autonomic the elderly is they they you no know, they perceive these symptoms very very late so what is the outcome they directly go into level 3 hypoglycemia or severe hypoglycemia level 3 means patient's cognitive function is so much impaired that they cannot correct the hypoglycemia by themselves. So ultimately they go into what we call uh, unconscious state. <coughs> Another challenge is frailty. So frailty is widely used term. It is associated with aging that denotes a multi-dimensional syndrome that gives rise to increase in the vulnerability. Okay, patients in simple word, patient becomes more vulnerable. And there are multiple scales for that. I've just put one of the scale here, very simple one. This is no, not to remember in your clinical practice. I would say just to give you an idea. And this is very important to set the A1C target for your patient. So this is a very simple thing. The patient is very fit, doing regular exercises. Then second grade is well patient. Third patient who is managing well. Fourth are vulnerable. They are doing their independent life till then. But sometimes they need some assistance. Then there are patients who are mildly frail, even they have some walking difficulties, independent walking, then moderately frail, severely frail, very severe frail, and last is the terminal ill patient, and where the life expectancy is less than six months. This is a simple one of the frailty scale, but you need not to remember, you need not uh, apply this to your practice, but see, the thing is, you take clue from this, and you set the individualized A1C goal for all your patients. So in simple one, how should we uh, proceed with our elderly diabetes patient? For assessment is very, very important, okay, especially the frailty. We want to individualize the target. So glycemic target, it can be relaxed based on the individual characteristics. But important thing, in otherwise healthy elderly also, you should have the same targets as younger patient, okay. Seven, the rule of seven applies there also. We must avoid hypoglycemia in our patient who have some kind of cognitive impairment. But on the other hand, we should not be so much relaxed because we want to avoid two main important things, symptoms of hyperglycemia. Okay? And second thing, our patient shouldn't go into the acute severe hyperglycemia emergencies, what Dr. Vipul was talking. And what should we select for pharmacotherapy? Anti-hyperglycemic therapy, we should be very, very cautious. Avoid and be very cautious with sulfonylurea or pioglitazone. Very, be very cautious. Look for you know, gastrointestinal tolerability of metformin. Very, very important thing. DPV-4s are usually the one of the safest. Okay, over, and they are preferred over sulfonylurea. For insulin, when we are using the regular human insulin or especially NPH or premix, we should switch them to basal analogs because they are very good safety regarding the hypoglycemia. And last part, give regular diets. No, very, which patients who are very, very frail, okay, and our dietitian, they give a so stringent chart that they are not able to eat properly. They don't even get their calorie goals to complete because of the chart. And their food uh, preferences, their taste preferences are very, very different. So for you no know, very frail patients or patients who are in admitted in nursing home, give them regular diet. Just avoid seat. Let them eat what they want to eat. Guidelines was also uh, there are so many guidelines, especially ADA, Canadian Diabetes Association, IDF. They have given this recommendation, but more of them all are similar. 
So what does the ADA says in older patients who are otherwise healthy, okay? With very few comorbid condition, you should set the goal to 7 to 7.5. So this is the for healthier elders. So it's not very much different. 7.5 is enough. And for those with multiple coexisting chronic illness or the, who have some cognitive impairment or functional dependence on other, you set the target up to 8. The up to 8 is also fine. Similarly, you should avoid hyperglycemia, which can lead to symptoms of hyperglycemia or acute hyperglycemia complication we should avoid. Also, uh, we should you know, reasonably relax the target as far as of individualized care. Screening of complications, again, uh, you know, we have to be little bit relaxed for screening also. Suppose a patient of 80 years come and you know, we advise cardiac investigations and patient is not able to walk also. So, remove the question of PMT test from that also. It's a simple thing. But it says, the guideline says, do screen for complication that can impair their functioning. So we must screen them for a retinopathy because once retinopathy develops and patients has dimness of vision, their functioning will be more dependent. So this is very important thing. And hypertension and cardiovascular risk markers as per age should be screened. Nutrition and protein intake, uh, Dr. Vijay Patni has already mentioned this, as is very, very critical for elderly diabetic patients. Protein intake is very, very poor, especially in Gujarat also, but for elderly also. And uh, regular exercise, including aerobic activity, weight-bearing exercise and resistant training should be done for elderly, for all older agents who can safely engage into these activities. And patients who are obese and overweight, okay, and who can do safe exercise, they should lose weight also. So this is again a, a important aspect that obesity management should not be missed in uh, elderly patients. Similarly, de-intensification we must do and we should first in the pharmacotherapy from hypoglycemic agents to non-hypoglycemic agents, avoid over treatment and uh, simplification of the complex treatment regimen. So very important thing when the patient is dependent on other for treatment of type 2 diabetes or any or insulin management, we should, as a part of clinician, actively de-intensify the treatment or simplify the treatment because of the multiple issues of caregiving. And similarly, we always, always encourage cost of treatment when the patient's you know, economics doesn't you know, allow. Sometimes we have seen so much uh, no, uh, stories like Hindi movies, ye iska treatment karega, ye bada larka ye karega, chota larka ye karega. There are so much, uh, actually all of us have, must have seen the, the cost of treatment for elderly who bears the treatment is again a, uh, a very, very interesting stories in OPD what we all see. So de-intensification for insulin, this is, I should have kept in last but I have kept here because of very simple algorithm. So this is the AD algorithm for elderly, you should you know, de-intensify. So it says simple word, patient who are on basal bolus treatment, who are on basal insulin alone, we should shift the timing from bed time to morning time and titrate the dose. We can relax the, base, the FBS or the fasting tar target from 90 to 150, depending upon the individual. For all other patients, what we do, every third day you increase the dose by two units if you are not getting the you know, target FBS. But for elderly, what ADA says, if your 50% of the fasting sugar level at home are coming high, then only you increase dose by two units, okay? Not on a single reading, you take an average and if more than 50% are coming high, you increase the dose. And similarly, any two fasting levels below 80, you reduce the dose. So it is more aggressively so actually it is less aggressive for glycemic control in elderly. Similar patient who are prandial insulin, ADA says if the prandial dose, suppose a regular acting dose before breakfast, lunch and dinner is more than 10, you need to reduce dose to half and you add some oral agents. And similarly, if the mealtime insulin dose is less, less than 10 unit only, very small doses of basal bolus insulins, you discontinue prandial insulin and add a non-insulin agents or even GLP-1 we can add. For premix insulin, okay, ADA says once the patient is taking premix insulin elderly, you can reduce the dose by 70% and use the total dose of 70% of total dose as a 
bezel only and especially bezel analogs are preferred. So another thing is self-management training. It is very, very important and we must include family members and other caregivers which includes hypoglycemia, medical nutrition therapy, physical activity, medication reviews day by day or weekly or monthly medication review is very important and we should evaluate for food care and amputation and other evaluate conditions. Pharmacotherapy wise, we know metformin. I, uh, the thing is limited use due to comorbidities like CKD, heart failure, etc. And we must consider GI side effects, particularly reduce intake. Patients, they don't eat at all if you use high dose of metformin. Many of the elderly, I would say, majority of elderly, they don't eat if we give high dose of metformin. They reduce the calorie intake and ultimately they lose weight also and B12 deficiency is there. SGLD2 inhibitors, wonderful cardiorenal metabolic benefits, low hypoglycemia risks. But similarly, we have to be cautious about urinary tract infections, hypotension and very important for is the fall. So postural hypotension and fall is very, very important, especially when these patients are on di concomitant diuretics. We should, when we start SGLD2 inhibitors, for those susceptible patients, reduce dose of diuretic before starting. Euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis is very, very important when these patients, elderly patients, they have long-standing diabetes, 25, 30 years, their in endogenous insulin secretion is less. Always be cautious about euglycemic ketoacidosis. Similarly, GLP-1 have low hypoglycemia risk, but there is nausea, vomiting, and similar GI side effects. Weight loss along with that, sarcopenia. So whatever the wonderful results are you seeing with the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists or double incretings or TB incretings agonists, they are associated with sarcopenia, okay? And the sarcopenia ultimately will, you know, uh, derange or the, you know, will evaluate the, you know, decrease the benefit of glycemic control. Similarly, DPV-4 inhibitors, they are the safest. The side effects are very, very rare as a similar advantages of low hypoglycemia and being weight neutral. For insulin, we have already mentioned, evaluate first. Appropriate insulin dose should be there. Start with less and then titrate. Monitoring is key. Recognize the threat of hypoglycemia. And last part is the using the technology to prevent the complication. And we know using CGMS will definitely help reduce nocturnal and undiagnosed hypoglycemia. So uh, thank you everyone for listening to me. Uh,